Good afternoon, everyone. We are so happy to be uh, with you this afternoon. Uh, good morning for if you're listening from the Americas and, and good evening if you're listening to us from Asia Pacific or the Middle East. Uh, I am Frédéric uh, Toiteau, uh, the chair of the Revenue Optimization Advisory Board for HSMA Europe. And I will be talking with you uh, with the team of Wesma, uh, the president and CEO of Revenue Generation and the head of the Revenue Optimization Board for HSMA Americas. We are so happy to uh, have you uh, this afternoon because, first of all, you are many, many attendees. Uh, a few hundreds are attending this afternoon, so it's a great success. And uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of HSMA Europe, uh, that uh, association that probably you know all of you, one of the industry's uh, leaders, uh, committee to grow uh, business for the hotels and for the partners through uh, 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 great tools, insights, and expertise. So um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the great panelists that we have, um, uh, Tim and I, with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, there are going to be four of them. So if I can get the slide for the panelists, uh, that would be great. So we will start with um, uh, Damiano Zenaro, who is going, uh, who is working for uh, IDs uh, as the revenue solution uh, uh, expert. So we're going to have as well working with us this afternoon uh, Cynthia Painter, who is uh, the vice president of pricing and revenue uh, at Accor Central Europe. Uh, we're going to have Nicole. Um, uh, Rion, Chief Commercial Officer at the Great National Group, as well as Angelica Sherma, who is the Senior Solution Consultant at OTA Insight. So a great panel for you this afternoon. Before we go through the, the actual content, I would like to have a, a little uh, word about the Code of Ethics. So if I can get the next slide about the Code of Ethics, I think it's important that we all uh, know uh, that it's important that we are going to talk about uh, pricing, we're going to talk about uh, some, uh, um, you know, uh, distribution content and uh, some uh, hotel uh, specifics. And it's important that uh, through HSMAI, discussions and issues presented in those meetings do respect the code of ethics and the expectations that the HSMAI Europe Advisory Board and Council has uh, agreed to respect. So those slides, you could get them uh, at the end uh, of the presentation uh, in case you want to read them better. So if we can go now through the, the actual uh, uh, topic itself, because uh, if uh, we are with you this afternoon, it's really because uh, we have a lot on our plate. Uh, the, the world is uh, upside down. The hospitality business is really uh, going through um, a huge uh, uh, turnaround. Uh, uh, we can call that a real big crisis. And what we wanted to do with you this afternoon is really to give you, uh, first of all, an update, um, a kind of update on with a, with, a, with a zoom on Europe to see what are the trends uh, that we are seeing right now. Uh, what are the, the, the tips and uh, as well the recommendations that we can give to hoteliers and to the partners uh, to uh, uh, battle and to try to be resilient and to be able to go through that crisis in the best way. That will be the first part of our uh, webinar. And then on the second part, in the next half an hour, we are going to go uh, through uh, the uh, perspective, the future, and trying to see what really uh, could we see as a recovery, uh, how we can prepare the rebound, uh, because that's so important for hoteliers as well to look ahead and to prepare the future uh, when it's going to come brighter. So, team, maybe you can uh, now have uh, um, um, maybe a start on, on the current situation, if you may. Absolutely. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, I, too, uh, would like to welcome everybody to the conversation uh, this afternoon. and. Uh, 
just a quick reminder that uh, this is a conversation that we're having. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but uh, we're here to really uh, gain some insight as well as just uh, dialogue with you. So if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, enter those questions into the chat window and we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. So just a brief presentation then on the current situation. Uh, some of this information is already old uh, because it's changing you know, day by day so quickly. Uh, but the first slide here um, just kind of shows the cycle uh, we're in right now. Um, you can see the, uh, the blue line is mainline China. And uh, they're, uh, they started tracking this information uh, starting on January 14. And um, it, seeing a very similar trend for Europe and UAE. Um, there is a little bit of a recovery happening in mainline China right now. If you look at the next slide here, and um, I must emphasize that it's just based on um, the information is public um, and the number of cases in China, um, you know, it's just basically what's being tracked right now. But uh, based on the information, uh, they're sort of uh, at a point now where they're, they're not seeing a lot of new cases. Uh, there is a little bit of a resurgent there. So uh, this even this information is uh, old already. Um, but you can see the uh, a little bit of recovery in the occupancy there. A majority of the recovery um, is the result of um, what we'll be talking about today, a lot of uh, interesting demand that uh, we wouldn't typically see in our hotels, um, medical people, uh, people quarantining, um, as, and the majority of this occupancy is mainly of international travel obviously happening to China right now um, for relief purposes there. Um, and then the final slide um, before we get into some of the questions here just shows as of March 15, so this information is a little bit old as well, but you can see um, everybody across the world um, is experiencing negative uh, growth year over year. Um, Italy obviously is uh, affected uh, significantly right now, uh, China, South Korea, uh, but you can see um, even the US right now, back then it was uh, down 27%. Um, the, the figures I've heard from last week, um, you know, outside of the hotels that are closed down, um, but probably will be around uh, 30 percent uh, for last week and uh, and will continue to decline as we progress with this so a um, bit of a big picture and it's difficult in some ways to look back at other um, downturns like uh, SARS um, 2008 uh, 9 11 and so on because the number of hotels that are just completely offline um, is unprecedented. You have to look back to World War II uh, to, to find a similar situation. So it's a very uh, unique situation that we're in right now. And uh, so, um, you know, what recovery looks like, we're going to talk about that, but uh, no one knows for sure. But uh, we're here today to talk about the current situation and uh, and what we're going to be doing or looking for in the future. And uh, this will be a continued conversation week after week as we learn more information. So let's just open this up to the panelists right now with a, a few questions. And then um, we'll take some questions from the audience on the first section, uh, just talking about the current situation. So I'm gonna ask the first question to Angelica. Um, we know uh, that a lot of hotels across Europe and are either closing or have to deal with very low occupancy and a high number of rooms out of order. From your vantage point, can you give us a global summary of the current situation in Europe? Yeah, so what's important here, I think, is the question almost um, makes us ask, is it all the same? And it's not. What I'd like to say to that is we can differentiate a little bit, even between 
um, the Europe, Middle East, and Africa, the different markets that we're seeing there. So when we're looking at our data here at OT Insight, um, we've looked at samples of different markets across, well, all, all over the world. And as we're looking across EMEA, for example, there are three cities that stick out that right now more than 50% of the hotels seem to be in the short term closed. Um, and those three cities are Barcelona, Paris, and Brussels. If we look elsewhere, well, you can see the, the other end of the spectrum, for example, would be Moscow, Istanbul, Dubai. There's almost 90% of the hotels that are currently still open and operating if you're searching for them and looking for a stay there. What is interesting, if you look across the region as well of EMEA, um, you will see that from May onwards, they're actually um, in agreement almost. Um, you're already going ahead into my slides there. Um, so as we look at May um, going forward, it seems as though all of these markets across EMEA agree. If you wanted me to talk a little bit to that slide already, and when we take a sample snapshot, it's actually um, just over 100 hotels per market. We look 90 days into the future, uh, look at a shop of a one night length of stay um, across the brand.com websites. And if a hotel returns a rate, we count that as open for that day. And if the hotel returns as sold out, we count that as closed. So um, there is, I think, on that next slide, that overview. I can talk to it now or later. Um, so what you see here um, is to the right hand side, it stretch, stretches 90 days into the future. And um, that, that first 10, 15 day window is what I'm talking about as short term. Um, I'll make it easier for you to read those um, at the bottom and I'll talk to them a little bit later in more detail. And those were Barcelona, Paris and Brussels. But yeah, um, as a little teaser of the information, there's a different story wherever you look. If you were to look at North America right now, there's really only New York where, um, where only about 45% of the hotels are open. And then San Francisco, Orlando, LA, that's between 65 to 85% open. So there's a different story. And again, Asia Pacific, more on the wave of recovery now where we're looking at consistently above 50% um, being open and bookable at this point. So what I think um, in differentiating this is really important is looking at the window of time that these hotels are open or closed for. And so those are the decisions that you're making right now. You're making a decision right now to open or close a floor or to open or close the hotel for a period of time. And why are you, for example, consistently choosing May at the moment to leave untouched? Well, is that because of your on the books business that's still remaining? Has it got anything to do with cancellations? Are you thinking about your customer right now? Um, I think, Tim, you just alluded to it, right? Medical staff, people isolating, who's coming in right now? Um, and what does that mean also going forward, right? Am I going to have a dis different customer going forward? So those are the decisions and thoughts to have. And I think talking in advance with Damiano as well, he had some perspective on that too. Yes, Damiano, I was going to ask you next. You know, you've got a unique perspective, obviously, uh, with ideas. Uh, what are you seeing? Well, I can I can really share the same that you share really team as well. And like I mentioned, is half. So all my thought to all of us and all of you, of course. So that's the first thing. Um, we see a mix of you know uh, situations, and that's what makes probably the situation more different. You know, than in the we see some areas with some slight recovery. We see some other areas that are expecting to go locked down. There are some areas that are completely locked down. There are hotels that are completely empty, hotels that are opening one floor. So that's what I think makes it very, very difficult all around because we cannot really speak out as, you know, one advising or one action. So I would just go back to say that every single hotel or region or city is really different. Now, what, what we see is that the hotels that are open, they are simply open because of a certain you know, a, a, a specific reason. So the only is what sessionals, right? a place that some some of the hotels decide just to get that to get into into that you know area. The second one is, for example, in Singapore, they just, uh, fourteen days stay at home before you 
uh, re-enter your country, for example. So there are some hotels that are creative in that, some packages, you know, with the full board, you know, in their hotels, for example. That's what's happening as well in Singapore. And I can expect happening this in some other country, like, for example, Australia or New Zealand, right? So, you know, it, it is a difficult situation. We see that they are reacting differently. What we just suggest at this stage is that, you know, stay, stay in communication, I would say, communicate as much as you can, really, because that's really what is missing sometimes. We have already, you know, far from each other. So if you don't, you know, you don't keep communicating, and I'm talking about internal and external, right? So not only you know, internal, but also external. So keep the communication as open as possible. Stay tuned, stay informed, because demand will come back. I mean, it's more the question of when and when and where back. More a question to stay calm now and just try to pick up all the information that you can and just prepare for what is really coming. So if I, if I see this is, you know, I think the communication is key. The fact of staying for the second key point, the system just try to still see what is demand coming, not for the 90 days, but probably for you know the next six months. We know that everyone is postponing on trying to postpone all their booking into probably the Q4. So hopefully, and let's keep you know, let's keep fingers crossed, we will have a booming Q4. So are you preparing for that? Um, for that? So that's, you know, you can do it by system. You can do it by your, you know, competition as well. So that's my really, you know, two cents, if you wish, of the situation. Understanding that it's really can try hotel kind as well. Thank you. Thank you, Damiano. Great, great insight. Thank you so for that. And I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear Cynthia Painter as well. Cynthia, she... She's, uh, of course, uh, right in the operations, being at a core head of revenue for, for Central Europe, where you cover uh, major countries like uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria. Uh, you know, Cynthia, hotels are in damage control right now. Uh, do you see any tactic, any lever that hotels uh, could activate uh, to boost the occupancy percentage? Okay, and maybe you could give, uh, uh, if you have any, some examples that uh, what ACO Hotels will be doing right now uh, to go in that direction. Great, thank you, Frederic. Yes, for our region here in Switzerland, Austria and Germany, a lot is driven by government restrictions at the moment. And a lot of our hotels are closed. Some of our hotels are working with governmental leadership to house emergency response personnel and so on. For me, I believe this is a time to collaborate, communicate and work with everyone, not only let's say within your own brand, but within your own market. For us at Accor, we're fortunate to have many hotels in some of these markets in the countries that I'm working with. So we share efforts and decide what hotels to close, which hotels to keep open. But I think a lot can collaborate within your market as well to support and take care of each other. And some hotels you may need to uh, work closely with each other and take care of some of the business that is coming in some hotels do need to close. For those hotels that are still open, it's important that, uh, of course, you're supporting the local legislation in regards to social distancing and communicating your health and safety measures should be upfront in what you're doing. Some of our hotels are even adding complimentary sanitary packs in the guest room, so hand sanitizer masks and so on. So for me, I encourage our hoteliers to think local, discover opportunities you might not have taken advantage of or seen before. Some hotels are actually managing ghost restaurants that aren't open for guests to dine in, but to do delivery only. Some of our hotels are actually working with their local businesses to offer guest rooms at reduced rates for workers that need a remote office. Most of our hotels have great internet, so this can be a great advantage for those that need to work from home. When regulations allow touristic travel again, 
think about offers to the local market, like staycations. These are a great consideration. A lot of parents out there who are working from home and having kids at home, they might want to get out of the house, but just not far away yet. They want to stay close in their local market. For me, a few um, important things here are keeping inspirational marketing alive. And while we might be reducing a lot of our marketing budgets and waiting to see how business evolves, there are still low cost opportunities to think about the destination and keep the hotels and those destinations in the minds of our guests when they're ready to travel again. Thanks, uh, Cynthia. Um, Nikki, I'm, I'm going to ask you a very similar question. Um, so you're, you're head of operations, commercial operations at a major hospitality group in the UK. And I learned this morning that all of your hotels are closed. Um, so do you agree with uh, what Cynthia is saying? Um, yeah, but uh, also, what are some things that you're doing right now, um, even though your hotels are closed? Um, and, yeah. And sales tips that you can uh, you can give to no, us? No, sure. Well, I mean, a lot of what Cynthia just said resonates absolutely with us too. Um, I mean, a lot of the, um, we represent independent hotels across the UK and Ireland. Um, so as independent and individual businesses, um, our owners are making the decision to close their doors. It's an incredibly difficult one. Um, but we do work very closely as a group uh, with, with government and we are looking at various initiatives to support hotels. So they may be closed to the general public, but are remaining open for various government needs, whether that's sort of a, um, a hospital or to house sort of uh, key NHS workers or other government workers who need to be in the area. Absolutely. I mean, with a with a lot of our hotels closed, I think one of the one of the biggest struggles for everybody is cash flow. Right now, um, and obviously we're all receiving an enormous number of cancellations. So I think there's been a big focus on how we manage those cancellations and how we try. Um, and make sure we don't lose those customers. So whether we're do doing things like vouchers, um, when a customer is canceling, we're encouraging them in the direction of um, a voucher, which they can then hold to redeem at a later stage when you know they want to book again, or just sort of focusing on vouchers in general, um, as opposed to trying to sell rooms, which at the end of the day, nobody wants to buy right now. And I think we have to kind of recognize that. So it's trying to look at what the hotels can be doing in the short term um, and keeping the inspiration going. Absolutely, as Cynthia says, um, you know, it's very tempting to want to draw back everything from a marketing perspective. Um, whereas I think you can just shift the focus of your marketing efforts and maybe focus on your restaurant. Um, how can, you know, there's a lot of stories around here, particularly with our independent properties where they're servicing their local communities, um, whether that be as a sort of a, a food home delivery service um, out of their restaurant so they can at least keep the restaurant going. Um, and just making sure that you are communicating what you're doing at a local level. Um, if and, and you know, no doubt what the great ideas are that are um, that are happening at at a local level in in the hotel. Make sure you're talking about them across social media. Making sure that you're talking to your database on a regular basis. Um, because at the end of the day, people are stuck at home. Nobody wants to be in self-isolation. I don't think the world has stopped shopping for travel. I think we're all we're all dreaming of that time when we can start traveling again. So it's a case, you know, how can you stay front of mind? And I think that's that's really where we're trying to keep keep the um, keep the positivity amongst the group and encourage our hotels in that direction. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicola. That was very, very clear. We, we are taking some uh, questions from the audience as well, from all of you all around the world. Uh, very good questions are popping up. There is, there is one question around the cancellation policy and what we should, uh, you know, recommend for, for cancellations. Who would like to answer that? Maybe you, Damiano? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, what happened with the year is probably virus, especially from... Um, third party and distributors, right? So um, 
for the ones who are working in the uh, in the industry, you all know what happened. It's, um, I would like just to you know highlight the fact that the Italian government, for example, is probably the only one, as far as I know so far, um, and that's the hotel associations under, of course, the Italian government, just to have a voucher system like you know Nikki was uh, you know um, mentioning. So essentially. Um, while there were some directions, you know, taken by distributors, I mean, the Italian Association in Italy was trying to split the cash flow. Um, they decided basically to say, you can basically, you know, refuse and just issue an invoice that has actually one year, um, uh, one year at a time just to spend that money. Um, you know, this is on... Uh, um, you know, depending on the, on the on the country, depending on hotel, but just think about it. Italy has been heavily, heavily impacted so far. So it's just basically equal to a 5% of occupants in the whole country. In fact, we probably be helping them just to, um, you know, make sure they can react somehow. So I just wanted to mention so far, I understand that there is an invoice system that can actually be done by independent hotels or by smaller hotels, you know, just to try to stimulate and postpone the, uh, the stay. But I think it's the only one so far as a, as a country that actually decide that they actually can go against there's been also far or ask computers just not to refund fully. So I just wanted to add this one, but um, it's a big one. I think it's a big one, especially for hotels, you know, think about the season, right? The summer resorts and so forth. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have we have a, a series of questions about um, about the safety of the employees because we are we are, we're having a webinar here about revenue. Uh, about distribution, about keeping the hotels in operations. But let's not forget we have, uh, of course, teams, employees, staff, uh, colleagues working in the hotels. What can you say about that? You know, is there any recommendations that you can make between uh, keeping a hotel open and maybe potentially risking having some uh, issues with uh, the safety of employees? Is it better to close the hotel in that case? What's your, maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, Nikki or, or Cynthia, uh, since you're close to the operations, do you have this already uh, uh, situation uh, in, your, uh, in, your, in your regions? Um, I think certainly for us, it's, it's the reason why many of our independents have decided to close their doors um, because they, they do struggle with that. I mean, there are various... Um, so certainly from from our government's point of view, uh, obviously to travel to and from work and various things like that. You know, we, we have various levels of, of, of lockdown now. Um, certain employees need sort of letters of authority to confirm that they are still indeed working and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think that I think that's the struggle. I think it's it's managing the people part of it, um, and as a result, I think that's why many of our hotels have made that decision to close their doors in the interests of safety, not only of customers but also of their employees. I agree with that, Nikki. I think for us, we've had a lot of the same topics come forward, and for core. In some of our markets here, we have more than one or two hotels. So we've made a conscious effort to talk with the employees. And if we feel that the employees themselves and the occupancy levels just can't sustain, mm -hmm. um, sometimes what we'll also do is ask, uh, well, who would like to keep working in a way, ask for volunteers. And then of course, for us, it's ensure that we arm them with all of the tools and ways to protect themselves. For those hotels that we've decided to keep open, we put in place very strict protocols and actually utilized even our own internal teams to build some protection, even something as simple as a plexiguard shield at the front desk to ensure we're doing what we can. Mm -hmm. But for, the, for those hotels we've kept open, we have actually asked for volunteers and wanted to ensure that no one was working when they felt compromised. Thank you, Cynthia. Great. And uh, Angelica, you wanted to add a word about the pricing uh, drop question because um, you know in this in this situation, I guess. It could be very tempting for hotels 
to uh, drop the price and to go into a kind of a price uh, war. And it's not even a war because now it's more like a pricing, uh, uh, you know, situation that everyone is, uh, you know, supporting. What yeah. is your your point of view on that? Yeah, I just saw the question pop up on the screen um, saying, you know, what should we do afterwards? Should we drop the prices a little bit? Um, um, you know, without advising anyone specifically on what to do, my initial thought seeing that from the discussion we're having here is just around, well, who's your type of customer when you're coming out of this? And I think the answer to that is very different for every market. So will that customer actually be incentivized to travel based on that price drop? Will your demand be changing based on the price? Or is it actually when we come out of this in your market, perhaps the case, that you have a different type of customer? Is it families that are trying to reunite after not seeing each other for a long period of time? Do you therefore need to add on parking? Um, to talk about pets, I think I've, I've seen that pop up somewhere in a question, changing policies. Is it that people will be more sensitive to cancellation policies going forward or more aware of them? Maybe thinking about some of that too. Um, so yeah, just adding a little bit of color, I think, to what else you know, might be, we might be able to do. Very good. So I'm going to, to, to leave the mic to Tim uh, for mm -hmm. the second part of this webinar. Just before, I'd like everyone um, listening to us, do not hesitate to uh, leave your questions, to write your questions in the chat, and uh, we pick them up and uh, we will answer them right after uh, the, the next uh, questions that we give to the panelists. Thank you so much, Tim. The floor is yours. Great. So uh, we, we want to move now to um, talking a little bit about uh, the road to recovery, what that might look like. And I know uh, I acknowledge right up front here, none of us really know what that looks like uh, for sure. But what are some things that we can, um, even though we're, we're going through a very difficult time right now, um, it's important for us to start thinking about the future and what are some indicators that we can uh, we can start looking at right now um, that would show a possible recovery happening in the future? We know it's going to happen. We don't know exactly when. Um, so to start this off, we're going to have Angelica uh, finish her presentation on um, on what observations that OTA Insight has so far. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm going to talk to you about in a quick five minutes um, is a little bit of data. I've summarized it here as three things to talk about. Hotel, av hotel availability, how hotels react as the supply changes, and also where we can observe and learn going forward. So really what I'm talking about is hotels open and closed, pricing now and looking into the future, and then demand. And a quick word on those first two points, um, availability and um, that pricing sample data. Um, it's not a secret. I'm showing you three, four, five markets here, but um, there's over 40 available and it's a free resource. So do get in touch if you want full access to this. Totally fine. So um, let's go right into it. So hotel availability, what windows are bookable? This is what I started showing you a little bit earlier. So you already know about the samples and how we arrive at, at this information that you're seeing, what hotels are returning as available, we count them as open. If they return as sold out, we count them as closed. And that's where for EMEA on the next one, you see um, quite a differentiated picture between, if we go to the next slide, um, thank you. Um, we see quite a differentiated picture between, for example, Barcelona, Paris, um, Brussels, having a lot of hotels closed in the short term, in the near term. And then by May, almost everyone right now returning to more of a um, being on the shelf, being shoppable and bookable on, um, online. So what we're really talking about here is temporary closures, right? There are some hotels that do this every season, right? That with their seasonality, it's just we don't know what the season is here yet. So um, what we see is that hotels are pushing this window again forward. And I'd like to compare that on the next slide to Asia Pacific, where um, the markets that you're seeing here, um, from the bottom up, those three, that's Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, 
um, those are the ones that are now starting to recover and appear in terms of availability again. Every market there, um, I've taken out the Australia and the kind of Pacific markets down there. Every market around China and Japan, you see that uptick in availability of the hotels as they start to open their doors. And so, what does that mean in terms of pricing and dynamics? What have we noticed now and going forward? I'll explain to you how we got to that data. So um, the sample is still the same. Uh, it's still over 100 hotels, 90 days into the future, brand.com, night length of stay. What you'll see on those next graphs is a blue line and a red line. The blue is based on hotels that have changed price versus seven days before. And the red is, on average for that day, how much did they change the price by? And what I'm giving you here um, is three different cities at three different points in time. Because my point is almost focus on the different dynamics at different points in the cycle. This is London two weeks ago. And as we look 90 days into the future, there were a lot of hotels that were adjusting their rates quite drastically at that point in time as the news was still evolving, as this was still quite new and something to just react to in that moment. And no one really knew yet about a lockdown or anything like that being enforced. You go to the next one. Now we're looking um, at data from one week ago in Barcelona. Barcelona had this a little bit sooner and started um, enforcing rules and, and regulations around this a lot sooner. So what you're seeing now, remember, there aren't actually that many hotels open in the Barcelona at this point in the Barcelona market at this point in time. So there's not that many hotels that are actually changing at this point in time. So the blue line is relatively flat, and the few that are changing it for that short period of time. They're actually adjusting that rate upwards again. So that's a market in a completely different point of that cycle. And then as we look out to Shanghai for a little bit of perspective, again, I'm giving you Shanghai um, one week ago here. Um, you're seeing around 30 to 20% of the hotels there acting on pricing. And what they're doing, oh, we're going toggling back and forth a bit. Let's go to our Shanghai again. Thank you. Um, and what we're seeing there actually is while there's still being some adjustments being made to some perhaps larger demand days in the near term, look out to the right hand side to June, the further along we go, they're actually starting to adjust those prices upwards at this point in time. So important to think about pricing. Where are you at now if you're open? If you're not open, um, when you will you be opening and what will you be doing about this? Because where is your market at? And so um, in the next um, part, I'm talking to you very briefly about where we can look to learn and what we're doing here. It's really based on demand and it's based on top of funnel demand, which is a research and development project we have here at OTA Insight. And we basically look at an extended set of data that is looking at where do you go to search first when you start booking your trip. You look for flights, trains, all of that, and we're accumulating that data before it appears on the books as an indication of demand. And what you're seeing here um, is for Shanghai, um, actually that, that was a, um, a GIF, so it was actually changing, um, in a, um, showing developing colors as well. It was multiple arrival days at the end of June. Um, I'll talk to it what you could see was that these red colors are appearing more and more on the heat map across Shanghai over a couple of days at the end of June, which is indicating that at this point in time, that demand seems to be returning slightly to that market, and that's a positive sign. So we hope to see that elsewhere, and it certainly correlates with what you saw about Shanghai adjusting pricing. Uh, towards June again, slightly upwards. Thank you, Angelica. Um, great insights. Damiano, maybe you can add a little bit on that because you are, um, <clears throat> I could say, the among us, the, the, the expert forecaster with IDs. Even if it is difficult to talk about the future, 
uh, when today's situation is so uh, tense. Can you give me, give us some insight about the demand forecast for the coming weeks, the coming month? Is there any way to predict a rebound? Is there any sign of a recovery in your systems? Um, I mean, we, we go back again. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just leading a team of advisor, right? For uh, on the, for you know, for our clients and for um, everyone. So we try to advise as much as possible. But of course, it depends again on where you sit. So it's, you know, we we I saw some questions coming around. You know, rates. Do we need just to drop rates? Do we need to? Um, well, I think we learned something from the past, hopefully, right? So especially hotels, especially after crisis or during crisis. So. I don't want to enter too much into the rate discussion because it can be a really, really open and wide discussion, right? Um, but I think we learned in the past that, you know, dropping rates, not not always, if almost never, uh, stimulate demands. Um, we know that the race to the bottom is, you know, it's a killer for all of us. And I'm talking about brands and I'm talking about small independent hotels. I'm talking about to everyone. Now, having said that, um, you know, and I hope really that we learn from the past and we know that hotels, the hotelier, sometimes we always, you know, tend to make the same mistake. I'm not saying it's the same as previous because this is a big one, really. I mean, I understand that everybody will be tempted, you know, just to drop rates. Um, what I would say and what I would just, you know, keep saying is that the forecast stays, you know, something that is relevant, very relevant because, the recovery or the bouncing back of the business will be influenced as well on how much prepared you are and how much are you just looking at data. So I'm not saying that you just need to forecast now for you know next month, especially in Europe, but we are starting already advising people in China, right, and in Asia, just to look at the small demand that is coming up. How do you want us to manage that? Now, and then I just don't want to go back into the discussion but you know that the technology and the human piece you know if you just can get back together i mean that's the, the winning synergy somehow so i think the forecast i cannot give you an advice in terms of how much are you forecasting today should would you need to forecast of course you need to forecast i think you need to forecast at any time it's not something you can actually forget because maybe now if you're closed there is nothing really you can do about it but you need to expect the demand coming back. And this is where the recovery that you just mentioned, Frederick, and all together, this is where we focus right now. So how would you like just to see your rebounds? And, and you know, and that's a lot of opportunities there. That's why I'm just in nature optimistic. But you have the chance now just to review your strategies, right? You probably have the chance now to see, okay, we start from zero. Unfortunately, it happens. You know, it will come back. Is it something that I want to do different than I actually did before? Is it something in my market segmentation I wanted to do that I can actually do it now? Are there any new guests or clients that you want actually to target that you never targeted before? And then suddenly you say, now I have the chance to do it. Think about your contract. Think about your local contract. You're going to start rebalancing on local contract. I heard Cynthia as well saying that everybody's focusing on that. People will not travel internationally. So why not start thinking about communication, about your staycation? Of course, it's like Cynthia said, I think, or Nikki. But stay focused on the local market because that will be the first one recovering. And I heard a lot of discussion there too because I'm in contact with all the GMs I know because I'm very curious to understand as well from their side what they're doing. They were saying that they will not have money to travel. I don't know. We don't know. However, everybody probably is looking forward to a weekend out once we can go out of this house. I can tell you. I'm just We locked down now for the fourth week. I think as soon as you can go out, yes, I think you will take the opportunity to go out. So think about all the other, you know, ancillary revenue you can actually offer as well in a weekend. Is the F and B? Is it the spa? Is it the swimming pool that you might actually have? These people want. We all want to go back and just enjoy some of the time. So my first, you know, advisor <coughs> advising, if you wish, to stay tuned and make sure you're prepared on your local market to start with. Is it corporate or is it leisure? But just start focusing there and look at the demand that will probably boom at a certain point. But keep an eye on your rates. I mean, that's, you know, it would be another killer for us if we just drop rate to 20, 30 euros or whatever and just start fighting each other again for a very, very small demand. But, you know, easy said than done. Uh, hopefully we learn from the past as well. So, and we can carry on that for a long time. I saw another couple of questions coming out, but <laughs> I just leave the word to the others. <clears throat> 
Well, thank you, Damiano. And uh, just as a follow on to that um, kind of leads into my next question. Uh, Nikki, um, is there anything that we can learn from the past? Um, and you know, this is this is different, obviously. And and how will we handle this situation on the recovery side of it, different than how we handled uh, the 9/11 or um, the downturn in 2008? Um, yeah. Any thoughts there? Yeah. No. I mean, I think the I think probably the the, the automatic reaction last time was was to drop rates. So I'm I'm hearing what's being said insofar as. Certainly, we are trying to encourage our hotels not to go down that route at the end of the day, if, you know, because once demand does start to recover, um, increasing rate at that point is going to get is going to get really tricky to do. Um, so trying to re resist reducing prices, I think we're all going to have to accept that although we desperately want recovery to come, I think recovery is not going to be some sort of automatic bounce back. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a recovery is going to be slow, uh, confidence needs to be restored. Um, um, but we are very much um, sort of focused on the fact that the growth will come from our domestic market um, and it will be primarily leisure driven. Uh, we are fully prepared for the fact that I think corporate, when we're looking across the segments, I think corporate travel and meetings and events in particular will be slow to recover because at the end of the day, we as, as people, these sorts of scenarios, um, people evolve. You know, we find new ways to do things, um, particularly from a corporate and meetings and events standpoint. So it will be interesting to watch that recovery because I do think that's going to be moving a lot slower than it's not going to just be a case of all of a sudden everybody opens up their travel programs again. I think, you know, companies, you know, quite often think differently after events like this when everyone's used to home working and, you know, collaborating and having sessions like we're having today you know, is there actually the requirement to do as much corporate travel as we were doing previously? It's just, you know, things to to keep in mind when we're looking um, at what the future might look like. I think what we also as hoteliers need to be very aware of is that, you know, unlike before, we also have a whole sort of different generation of traveller who likes to travel and stay differently now. You have to look at the volume of alternative accommodation that is now available to customers. We're not just talking about ourselves as hoteliers, you know, um, you've got Airbnb, you've got, you know, there'll be campsites, there'll be everything. I mean, everybody's everybody's suffering, obviously, at the end of the day. But it's not just hotel versus hotel anymore. We're going to be competing in a very different space. So I think what is going to define recovery for, for hotels is how they can utilize this scenario to think creatively and think differently um, about their own businesses and focus perhaps um, less on rate, but more on packages, you know, uh, for your domestic customers, how you might do things differently, how you um, and keep the focus on flexible cancellation policies because I think that's going to have to you know advance purchase as a concept it's going to take a long time to come back I think people are going to be still very uncertain for a while so so whether or not you know we we focus on staggered cancellation policies or just keep keep that you know we're championing flexi rates everywhere it's almost like we've taken advanced purchase off sale and we're now focusing very much on packages and inspiration, um, particularly for our, we're, we're quite fortunate with our hotels, they're, they're very sort of secondary and tertiary locations. So we we lend ourselves well to that type of business. Um, but as, as, um, as Dominique was saying, you know, very much the ancillary spend, people are going to want to go and, and enjoy themselves again and get pampered again. So it's almost like the accommodation bit is secondary. I think we need to lead with that experiential bit because everyone's craving that right now, aren't they? We all don't want to be, don't want to see the four walls of our own house anymore. We, we can't wait till we're in the spa and we can't wait till we're outdoors enjoying fresh air again. So I think that's where our focus is um, in terms of driving that recovery as well. Great. So making it as easy as possible for them to make that decision to go ahead and make that booking would be very important at this. Absolutely. Time. Angelica, you, you wanted to say something as well? Yeah, I think um, in comparing uh, 
a crisis in 2001, 2009. Now, what's important there also is how, you know, how can that recovery be different, right? It used to be that occupancy returned before rape. Um, and that's certainly, it seems to be, it seems to have set the expectation for now. Can we learn from past crises? Of course, sure we can. Can we learn from other places that are elsewhere in this cycle of this outbreak? I think we can do that too. And do we have very different support now to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, in terms of what data is available, what tools there are, what webinars there are, like us here today talking like a global mastermind of people getting together. Um, I think we know a lot more now. We don't just take the temperature anymore, we also take the pulse, right? So we. Um, we take backwards and forwards looking data and that's certainly different as well. And I love what Nikki said there about the different traveler and how their expectations are different and they will be even more different going forward, right? So there's a couple of things that I think certainly will be different while we can also learn from the past. Yes, of course. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> Cynthia, I'd like to hear you maybe uh, uh, before we take a, a few more questions from the audience. Uh, about um, uh, the hotel groups and uh, so you're working again for Accor so you probably have some uh, um, let's say procedures in place or any kind of uh, strategy that you're trying to roll out for the recovery or for the um, you know uh, rebound that you can expect in the coming weeks can you give us a bit of uh, insight on that how, how hotel groups are organizing themselves Sure, happy to, Frederic. So for me, firstly, it's important not to be ver um, overly pessimistic, but realistic. So your short term to medium term planning um, needs to be very data driven, your longer term planning very much in alignment with your recovery strategy. And you may be considering different recovery models um, not just one recovery model by segment and continuing to manage and observe those diligently. For me, I'm going to be an advocate first of back to the basics here. So reviewing your booking patterns and your cancellation patterns as they evolve, it's likely they're going to be evolving for months to come. So stay informed on how the business is evolving. Your segments likely will have or will intentionally change. So it's important to be observing those and adjust accordingly. For me, OTA Insight is a great tool for us to observe the comp what the competition is doing, and not only at hotels' particular competition, their current view of competition, but looking at the whole market, you probably will see um, different competitive patterns evolving. So using those ad hoc features as a tool are great to seek information on what your competitors are doing. Using your revenue management system, like ideas, to alert you to booking patterns into the future and what segment shift um, is intentional and part of your strategy and uh, also alerting you on what's going on there and helping you to identify demand patterns as they're evolving to proactively take action. Forward-looking demand tools like uh, TravelClick's Demand360 is also really great to see what's going on in the, in the marketplace overall. So for me, it's important to think about all of the tools in our toolkit, be very data-focused, and encourage your, um, educate your leaders and continue to keep them updated on how the business is evolving. Collaborative working, database decision-making, and fast action. Great, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so we'll go to the audience now and uh, just ask a couple of questions uh, just on the few minutes that we have here. Um, there were a couple of questions around independence versus uh, brand. Um, who's going to be the winner in this? Um, this is a debate that uh, Nikki and Cynthia can have. <laughs> um, Nikki, your your assets are uh, more independent. Um, 
do you want to start and uh, and let me know your thoughts? Uh, you <laughs> know, brands obviously have a lot of marketing uh, behind them to, to yeah. kind of help them recover. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts uh, with your portfolio? Um, I mean, I think there, there, there is always a place for both, isn't there? And I think, you know, um, I, I, I don't think it, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, if we're, if there's an industry, we're going to come out of this well, then I think if anything, there is always silver linings in these sorts of, um, these sorts of scenarios. And I would like to think it would bring greater collaboration across the industry. Um, because, you know, the, the, the brands will feel it too from a, from a alternative accommodation perspective. Um, you know, uh, they were before this even happened, you know, you, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of them are launching their own versions of sort of uh, self catering accommodation options. It's not just, um, so I think, you know, we've we've just got to. I, I would like to say that, you know, fr from my perspective, I would like to see more collaboration across the industry. Um, maybe even, you know, collaboration between brands to keep um, the recovery going. Because I, I, I and, and partnerships forming off the back of it. Um, you know, there has been some uh, some partnerships. We you know whether it's been sort of between loyalty programs. Um, I, I'd like to think this it will it will call it will recreate the industry and the spirit of tourism. We've got a long way to go before this recovers. Um, I don't think we need to be talking about battling each other for it at this moment. I don't. I think at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we are um, we're encouraging people to travel again, full stop. Um, so if that means, you know, working with things like tourist boards, you know, for example, for us, it would be, you know, Visit Britain and so on and so forth. I know they collaborate with all sorts of different partners, brands and independents alike. But I think we all have um, our unique selling points. Uh, you know, ours is our independence and the fact that we are very local. Um, we offer an experience of the destination in a way that perhaps a brand can't. So, you know, that's what we will hold on to and we will continue to champion. And hopefully that will be what people are looking for when they when they come out the other side of this. I, 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 think, go ahead, I think no, I think I'll support what Nikki is saying wholeheartedly. I think you've already heard me speak about the collaboration in local markets that I think is critical not only for today but for tomorrow and i don't see uh, an us versus them in any segments of the industry at all i think it's you know just like i said our markets to recover we need to think local we need to think about all of us together and collaborating and finding our own way out of this I th i'd like to, the second point that nikki made that i'd like to pick up on was uh, her visit britain comments so d destination marketing will really support us as we start to grow beyond local markets um, and then start to think about international travel again. And for those mm -hmm. of you um, who might have seen the Destination Portugal recent campaign, I think that's really perfect in terms yeah. of how it's thinking about, uh, yeah, right? Thinking mm -hmm. about um, demonstrating to say, okay, we're on pause, right? It's still okay to dream and to think about for yeah. now. It's important globally we take care of each other and keep keep each other safe. Um, but those great places, destinations and so on will still be there. And Europe obviously is a great place for a lot of that inspirational travel. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for your perspectives there. So the next question, uh, I'll just open it up to anyone that wants to answer it. Um, considering revenue managers are the ones that deal with the, most of the forecasting, uh, do you think one of the consequences of this crisis is that their role will also include risk management in the future? Wow, only risk men. I mean, <laughs> I said, uh, so, so I just take this one very quick. I think it's, you know, we're discussing the role of revenue manager for the last 10 years, I believe. And we are shouting, you know, from all, you know, from all angles that, you know, revenue managers should evolve yeah, with the uh, with the technology and should evolve with everything what's actually happening in the in the industry. Hospitality 
has evolved so much in the last, you know, five to 10 years, man. So I think that is not, we shouldn't actually wait until this crisis just to make sure that revenue managers should expand, you know, their, you know, fields. Uh, reservation is definitely something that should have been there already. I will probably more look around, you know, the 360. Is it total revenue management? Is it more around, you know, you know F&B piece? Is it more around distribution? You know, so I think... There's much more than only reservation, but I welcome the questions very well because this is something passionate to me a lot because the evolution of revenue manager is there for a long time. So, mm. um, yeah, definitely, I would say reservation at least to, to start with. Anyone else want to comment on that? Angelique? Okay. Um, so... Uh, we uh, we had a lot of questions, and I apologize that we can't get to them all. The hour went by very quickly. Uh, so just uh, for a quick wrap-up then, uh, Frederic, you want to take it away? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So maybe we can have the conclusion slide, um, <clears throat> Enzo, on the slide, yeah. Uh, we, you know, on behalf of HSMA Europe, I, I really... Uh, uh, wanted to thank you for attending this webinar. I hope it, it, uh, it's only, if not the first, not the last one you will be attending with us because there will be a series of webinars that we're gonna make in the coming week, weeks through HSMA Europe in the same uh, type of link. Uh, um, I would like to thank uh, uh, team again uh, uh, from uh, North Carolina, Angelica from New York, Damiano from Italy, Nikki from London, Cynthia from Munich, and even myself, I was in Paris. So you can see that we live in a global village. So we are all in different locations. And I wanted to thank all you, uh, you all for attending this webinar. You were close to 600 people this afternoon with us. Uh, close uh, more than 300 on YouTube and more than 250 on LinkedIn Live. So it's a great success. We really hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, I just want to say that HSMA Europe uh, is not uh, ending now. We have a lot of content on our websites. You see the link here, and we're going to share the presentations with, with you later on. Uh, and I just want to, to quote as well the fact that HSMA, HSMA Europe is going to, to have very interesting activities in the near future, uh, starting with the complementary training courses that uh, uh, we are going to provide uh, to the staff and the teams in the hotels, so the employees, for them to, you know, take advantage of that special situation that we are living in to upgrade their knowledge and to uh, bring up the expertise. For us, it's very important, and I'm sure that's going to be a great opportunity for you uh, in the hotels. So thank you so much, everyone. It was a pleasure to have you uh, this afternoon uh, from everywhere in the world. We look forward to uh, speaking with you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.